thanks very much for the invitation and the introduction. I'm always happy to visit Toronto. People at the back, can you hear me? Or do I need to speak louder? Okay, we're good. Okay, today I want to tell you about work that I and members of my group, which means mostly members of my group, including my excellent grad students, Hong Wen Liu, Greg Ridgway, and Chi Liang Wu, have done to explore what effects dark matter could possibly have on the early history of our universe if it, if it had some non-trivial interactions, either with itself or with the visible particles that we know about. Now, I realize that probably not everyone in their room spends as much of their time thinking about dark matter as I do. So I'm going to um, begin by talking about why this is an interesting puzzle in the first place, what we think we understand about dark matter, and what questions that leaves open. The second category turns out to be much larger than the first. Um, and I want to try to persuade you that looking at astrophysical and cosmological data sets hold a lot of promise for trying to understand properties of dark matter that are currently unknown. Okay? Then I want to go on and give you some specific examples of that. In particular, we have a beautiful understanding of how the universe behaved quite early in its history. I'm not talking about the first few fractions of a second after inflation here, but you should think about when the universe is a few hundreds of thousands to a few hundreds of millions years old. In that period, it turns out that even very tiny fractions of the dark matter interacting with visible matter can have meaningful effects on the temperature of the universe and its ionization state, and those in turn we can observe using the light of the cosmic microwave background and the 21 centimeter radiation. So I'll tell you about how that works, I'll talk you through why we can do these searches, why it's a sensitive probe, and say a little bit about what we can learn from it. And at the end, if time permits, I'm going to sneak in uh, a bit of history from closer to the present day. Once the galaxies start to form, everything becomes much more complicated. But if dark matter particles interact with each other, my group has done some recent work suggesting that the, there are interactions between the dark matter particles could change the history of the Milky Way satellite galaxies in interesting and possibly observable ways. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. If you want to ask questions as I go, I don't mind if the tradition here is to hold questions for the end, that's fine with me as well. Okay, so let me, so now that I've told you all the spoilers, let me go ahead. So what is dark matter? What do we think we know about it? Well, two components, dark and matter. So by dark, what we mean is that it doesn't, it's something that doesn't scatter or emit or absorb light to a significant degree. We could really call it transparent matter or invisible matter instead of dark matter. We think the light just passes straight through it. But it does have mass and hence gravity. So that's more or less the name. If it didn't have these two properties, we would call it something else. And pretty much everything that we know about dark matter at this point is either a negative result, it's something we know that it doesn't do, or it comes from this property that we've observed through its gravitational pull on other particles. We believe that it's about 84% of the matter in the universe. I'm going to say more about this later in the talk, but we measure this from looking at what's sometimes called the Big Bang afterglow radiation or the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is an image of that radiation. This is essentially a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was only three or 400,000 years old. And from the patterns in that radiation, we're able to tell that about 84% of the matter should interact gravitationally, but should not interact significantly with light. We believe, though you saw that, that picture that I just showed you, I said that was the snapshot, oops, a bit too far back, that was the snapshot of the universe at three or 400,000 years old. These little fluctuations here, the hot spots and cold spots, that corresponded to regions of higher and lower density in the early universe. We believe that at later times, those regions of higher and lower density seeded a cosmic web of structure that forms the primordial scaffolding for all the galaxies that we see today. This is a plot made by some, a number of people in the Eleusis collaboration, including my colleagues at MIT. The panels here are going from early times at the bottom up to later times at the top. The pattern on the left is what we believe the dark matter is doing. So this invisible gravitating matter is forming these giant web-like structures through our universe, seeded by those density fluctuations that we see in the cosmic microwave background radiation. As time goes on, the points that there are nodes of high density in these structures that grow more and more dense. And in the meantime, the visible matter is shown in the right-hand panels here. The visible gas, everything that we can see, is getting gravitationally attracted into these regions of high dark matter density. It's pooling there, it's accreting, forming high density regions, which can then form the seeds for stars, for galaxies, and for eventually for planets and Earth and people like us. 
So we believe that on all the visible matter that we see, the universe that looks like this, is painted on top of a, he of a heavy scaffolding of invisible matter. Now, from that, that's based on simulations, and from that you might already infer that if we see visible matter, if we see a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, they should be surrounded by the cloud of dark matter, since the presence of that cloud of dark matter is what causes it to form in the first place. We actually, historically, this story went the other way. We found the clouds of dark matter first, and then we tried to understand what they were made from. So we do believe that essentially all galaxies, maybe not 100%, are surrounded by these large clouds of dark matter. So this is a cartoon, the visible galaxy that we can see. We live in the Milky Way, which is a spiral galaxy. It's at the center. It's surrounded by a large halo of dark matter. So, and we can map out, by looking at how stars and gas clouds move in these galaxies, we can map out the properties of these halos. So these are all positive statements. These are all things that we believe the dark matter does, properties that we believe that it has. But the last property that we know is that if it interacts with other particles at all, it does so pretty weakly. I said that it doesn't interact with light very strongly. Well, that holds true for all the particles that we've really tried to search for these signals with. Uh, there have been many attempts to look for the effects of dark matter interacting with visible matter. So far, um, modulo a few anomalies that are not totally well understood yet, they've all come up null. So that sets an upper bound on how strongly it can interact. Now, this information is enough to tell us that the, dark, it's, that the dark matter can't be any of the particles that we know about. We need a particle that's stable and long-lived. It can be 84% of the matter in the universe, and it's been that way since the primordial uh, cosmic microwave background radiation was emitted. That eliminates most of the particles that we know about right away because most are unstable. Once we go to the stable ones, most are electrically charged. The exceptions are the neutrinos, but neutrinos are too light and too fast moving, and they wouldn't form this primordial scaffolding, and they wouldn't form these clouds of dark matter around galaxies. So uh, that's, uh, that's the problem. That's the puzzle. So this leaves many open questions, with the big one being, well, what, what is this stuff? What are we looking at? What, are we, what, what is building this scaffolding that we believe supports our visible universe? We can subdivide that into a lot of other questions. What is this made for, dark matter made from? Are we looking at some kind of new stable particle? Are we looking at many different new particles? Maybe you can do it without having introduced new particles at late times per se. Maybe you need, maybe there are ancient black holes, but they would have to be very tiny, left over from very early in the universe's history before stars were formed. There's a little bit of parameter space still open for that. Um, that would, however, still probably require new physics in the early universe. So where did, this, where did it come from? Why, why does it have the abundance that it does? Why is it 84% of the matter in the universe and not 0.001% or 99.999%? Does it interact with ordinary particles at all? I said there was an upper bound. That doesn't mean it's zero. It could be just something that we haven't detected yet. And in fact, in much of this talk, I'm going to be really hoping that it's something that we is there, but we just haven't detected yet. That's an open question. And I could keep going with questions like this for a long time. So um, if you give particle theorists a problem like this, then what happens is something like this. And I can say this because I'm a particle theorist. <laughs> so um, this is a slide taken from a talk by my colleague Tim Tate as part of the snow mass process that our field went through in the US about six years ago. Now, I don't want you to understand everything on this slide. I'm not sure I completely understand everything on this slide. So um, what I do want to take away from this slide is, is three things. So everything within the red region on this slide is a class of scenarios for what dark matter could be. Everything outside the red region is a broader puzzle in fundamental physics that dark matter might connect to. So three things that I want you to take away. First, we have plenty of ideas for what dark matter could be. Our problem is not that we have no candidates for what the dark matter could be, that we, we have the opposite problem, <laughs> that we have many possibilities and we don't yet have good experimental tests that can distinguish effectively between them. So a second point is that Parker, we have all these ideas. Many of these ideas, if we could understand what the dark matter was, it could also serve as a key to unlock a deeper understanding of other problems in particle physics. Dark matter could be the lightest particle of one of many super partners that reveals some new fundamental symmetry of the universe. It could be related 
to the presence of extra dimensions in our universe. It could be related to the properties of the Higgs sector or the neutrino sector. It could, um, tell it, it could be related to deep problems in the theory of the strong interactions. It could be an axion of some kind. There are ideas for models of dark matter, some of which I've worked on, where the dark matter interacts via a new force that only it feels in the same way that the particles we know about feel electromagnetism, whereas the dark matter does not. Our dark matter could be, the, it could be our key to a whole new sector of interactions. So understanding this puzzle is both important on its own and it's a place where we can look for signs of new physics and which if we understand it could unlock a deeper understanding of new physics beyond this immediate question. And the third thing I want you to take from this is that at present, all of these scenarios are basically allowed and in the data that we have at the moment, all of these scenarios are basically indistinguishable. So if we want, but at the same time, for the question of what is the bulk of the dark matter, most likely of the ideas on this slide, at most one is correct. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> it may be zero. So the question then becomes, how do we tell the difference? You know, and if, and you know, you know what, what are channels where we can look, where we might be able to see a signal that would give us our one, that would give us our one true candidate or tell us that it's none of them or channels where if we don't see something, we can meaningfully say, all right, I can stop thinking about this class of dark matter models, no point looking for it in other channels, we would have already seen it here. So, what I'm gonna tell you about in this talk is everything I told you so far about dark matter, basically, we've learned from astrophysical and cosmological observations. The examples I showed you already used information from many data sets, ranging from studies of galaxies, looking at the clouds of dark matter around them, to light emitted when the universe was a tiny fraction of its age today, those data are written now, and also most of what I showed you was studies from a decade or two decades or three or four decades ago. So these data are getting re are really rich and they're getting better all the time. So what can we do today to use these data to test different ideas for the nature and origin of dark matter? And the approach that I wanna take to this is, suppose I thought about generic ways that dark matter might possibly interact with visible matter, how would it show up in some of these data sets? Now, before I go on to, uh, yeah, okay. So what are some possibilities? If I wanted to just say, how would my hypothetical dark matter candidate interact with the particles we know about, what can I look for? Well, one possibility that always comes up when you talk about astrophysical and cosmological searches of dark matter is that in many models, when two dark matter particles collide with each other, they can produce visible particles. So here, two dark matter particles come in, a miracle occurs, this is the new physics that we would like to probe, visible particles are produced. So SM stands for standard model here. Now these could be quarks or leptons or gauge bosons. As I said before, most particles we know about are unstable, so they will generally decay, and that according to the processes that we understand, and that will produce a spectrum of long-lived known particles. So these could be photons, electrons, positrons, um, protons, antiprotons, neutrinos. So in many contexts, this is what we'll be looking for, an uh, um, injection of particles coming apparently from nowhere but really from the dark matter. Now, in, many of the, in some of the scenarios that I showed you a few slides ago, this process is tightly linked to how much dark matter we have in the present day. So the question of how the dark matter interacts and how it got its abundance, where it came from, are the same question in these scenarios because in those cases, there was initially a lot of dark matter in the early universe, much more than we see today, and it was depleted by this exact process, dark matter particles annihilating with each other and producing visible particles. Now, not all scenarios are like that. This is a subset of the possibility for dark matter. But in those scenarios, you have a benchmark annihilation rate. You find that if this is the annihilation cross-section, and if you don't know what a cross-section is yet, don't worry about it, just think of it as a rate. This, um, that this tells us that the uh, number that parameterizes the annihilation rate has to be roughly of this scale, one over the Planck mass times the um, temperature of matter radiation equality in natural units, which corresponds to, in particle physicist units, this is about one over 100 TeV squared. Um, in astrophysicist units, this is two times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. So uh, again, two things I want you to remember about this. Later in the talk, I'll sometimes show a line on plots that says thermal relic cross-section. That's this number, okay? So when I mean that, all I mean is if you're on that line, if you would detect a signal at that level, it would explain the abundance of dark matter as well as being a dark matter signal. Um, if that line is ruled out, it tells you that you can't make dark matter in this way. You have to find a different mechanism. The other thing here is that um, this scale 
is also pretty much the same scale of interactions that you would expect if dark matter is sort of roughly at the TeV scale and has a coupling similar to the electromagnetic coupling of about 10 to the minus two. And that fact that this scale is what you would naturally get out of roughly electroweak scale interactions is sometimes called the WIMP miracle, where WIMP stands for weakly interacting massive particle. But this statement, that this annihilation rate gives you the right amount of dark matter, is just a general statement. It doesn't really have much to do with particle physics. Okay, so that's one kind of generic interaction structure. What's another interaction structure? Well, the dark matter might not be perfectly stable. We know it has to last for the age of the universe, but um, maybe, maybe if we waited for long enough, a lot of the dark matter would decay away. So in this case, same picture, physics is at some point the dark matter can decay, again, through new physics, the miracle that we would like to understand, producing visible particles. Again, those particles would decay, produce long-lived known particles. So again, what we'd be looking for is a spectrum of particles coming from regions where there's a lot of dark matter, this would lead to a slow trickle of energy into the visible universe. Over time, we can search for the effects of that. I should say, like I'm drawing this like it's a decaying particle, but if I had primordial black holes, they decay away via Hawking radiation. So they behave like decaying dark matter for these intents and purposes. Okay, so that's another interaction structure. The difference from the first one is just how many dark matter particles you have involved. Um, we could also look at like multi-body annihilations where I have three or four or more dark matter particles in the initial state because for most dark matter candidates, the density of the particles is pretty low today. Those higher body processes tend to be suppressed, but you can definitely take them into account. I can say more about that if people are interested. And a third structure that we can think about is, well, maybe you're not creating standard model particles. Maybe dark matter just bounces off standard model particles. This in some ways in terms of energy transfer would have the opposite effect to the processes that I talked about. So this is um, if the dark matter is noticeably colder than the standard model particles, which we have reason to think that it usually would be in most models, then this kind of in this kind of scattering, the dark matter could act as a heat sink for the standard model particles. So rather than having new particles appearing out of nowhere, you would have energy draining apparently into nowhere, but really into the invisible dark matter. So, um, and we could also, so that's if dark matter particles bounce off standard model particles, transfer energy to them, but we could also think about the effect of dark matter particles bouncing off other dark matter particles, and inducing a heat flow between those particles. That is something that I'll come back to right at the end of the talk, because what that mostly changes is how the dark matter is distributed within this cosmic web. Okay, so these are all just sort of very generic structures. What I want to do next is understand how we might see them. I'm going to just impose a little bit of a caveat first. The search for dark matter, it's a huge multifaceted search program. It involves many, many people around the world. What I'm going to talk about today is one little slice of that program with one particular set of observables that I'm particularly interested in. Um, those of you who are students here should be aware that there are, if you're interested in this, there are many faculty members here working on related work. So this is a very non-exhaustive set of examples. I apologize if I let you out. There are people here working on super sensitive underground searches for dark matter scattering off visible particles, as we talked about in the last slide. There are people uh, working on you know, searches for new exotic long-lived particles, forces that the dark matter might interact through. There are people working on new experiments to map out how dark matter is distributed and you, analyzing the data from those experiments looking, um, like that, looking at, um, by looking at gravitational lensing and people looking at collider experiments, working on collider experiments where you might hope to make dark matter from scratch. Um, you can map out dark matter with stars. You can analyze the motions of stars to try to understand where it is. You can look at models of dark matter like the ones I talked about earlier, axion dark matter and their effects on cosmology. So this is a big community. You have great representation of this community here. So if you want to, if anything about this colloquium interests you and you want to learn more, um, you know, talk to your local faculty. Okay, so that caveat aside, now I'm going to talk about my stuff. Um, okay, but I guess first I might just pause and ask if there are any immediate questions at this point, unless you want, unless I should hold quite a few. Let, let me just ask if there are any immediate questions at this point before I start talking about the signals. Yeah, so, so yeah, so, so I, I, I was a little bit weaselly there. I said that the answer for what's the bulk of the dark matter, probably there's the most one answer, which I think is true. Like, I mean, it could, 
there could be dark matter, you know, if there's one thing that's 95% of the dark matter and then there are a bunch of other things that are 5% or 1% or 0.1%, I wouldn't be like, I, you know, that wouldn't super surprise me. It would surprise me a little bit if there were three totally unrelated things that were each a third of the dark matter. I mean, it could be, like, it could be, that's why I said probably, but um, my expectation is that probably the bulk of the dark matter is one thing. But yeah, there could totally be subdominant components, but, and, and there are even cases where the subdominant component might be easier to detect than the main component. Like if the main component was really in a really barely interacting at all, and there was a subdominant component that was much more strongly interacting, then we might find the subdominant component first. Um, but for a lot of, so, but you know, given equal interaction strengths, the one that's most of the dark matter is gonna be the thing that we find first. Yeah, question over there. Yeah, so you can have a case, you can, yeah, so certainly dark matter doesn't have to, none of the structures that I just wrote down actually have to exist. It could be that dark matter's only interactions are gravitational. And then like everything I tell you about in the rest of this talk, we should expect that when you do the searches, you, um, you don't see anything or you learn about some interesting astrophysics, but you don't find dark matter. The thing that gives me some hope that is not the case is the fact that the dark matter and baryon abundances are really very similar in the scheme of things, like they're only different by about a factor of five. If they're really completely disconnected, have nothing to do with each other, you know, have no relationship to each other, just then, then it's a little bit of a coincidence to me that that, that factor of five to one. But um, yeah, could be, people sometimes call that the nightmare scenario. <laughs> uh, if, that's, if that's the case, then it may be that this is not the best way to learn about new physics. But um, yeah, I, I have hope that that is not the case. Okay, so let me now talk about the observables that we're gonna look at to try to look for these. So again, so what I've said so far, these generic interaction structures give transfers of energy between the dark matter and the visible matter. They can go in either direction. You can inject new high energy particles into the visible matter, or you can take drain energy away into the dark sector. So let's look at how this would uh, look in some observables. Let me first tell you about the observables. So I'm gonna talk about the history of the universe in terms of the redshift, which I'm gonna call Z. So one plus Z is the factor by which the universe has expanded since that time. So today, Z is zero. The universe, well, but 10 seconds ago, the Z was uh, very, very slightly more than zero. The universe has expanded by a factor of one plus epsilon since I, since I began this sentence. Uh, when the universe was three or 400,000 years old, the universe was linearly about a factor of 1,000 smaller. So that corresponds to one plus Z of 1,000. Why do I say, so this was an important time when the universe went through about redshift 1,000. So at this time, the universe was filled with a hot plasma of electrons, protons, and photons, and we think also dark matter and also neutrinos. So at this time, the temperature of the universe was about 3,000 degrees. Um, it, was, it was pretty hot. There weren't any stars. There weren't any galaxies. It was just a bath of plasma. But at, when the universe uh, is expanded, a little bit further and went through redshift 1000, the, the temperature dropped to the point that it was no longer hot enough to maintain that plasma in an ionized state. So then all the electrons and protons started bonding together. The level of ionization dropped off abruptly um, and photons are really good at scattering off charged particles but bad at scattering off neutral particles. So at that point they began to stream free of the electrons and protons. Those photons, so the last time they scattered on anything was when the, was this plasma when the universe was three or 400,000 years old. Some of them hit our telescopes today. And those telescopes are the first thing that they've scattered on in almost 14 billion years. Those are called the photons of the cosmic microwave background. And they give us essentially a photograph of the cosmos when it was in this plasma state and only three or 400,000 years old. There are two kinds of information in this image. There's the spatial distribution of the fluctuations across the sky. This is the picture that I showed you earlier. So these are showing the tiny um, temperature and density variations in that primordial plasma. And we can also look at the energy distribution of this signal. People usually talk about the former, and in fact, we haven't actually measured the spectrum since uh, 1990 or so, so, which is probably before half the audience was born. So, um, but when we did that, and partly that's because the measurement was so good already in, uh, in the early 90s. So this is that measurement. This is looking at the spectrum. So this is the intensity of the photons as a function of their frequency. Uh, this 
So, so these are the data points from FireEyes. This solid line that goes through the data points is a black body spectrum that's been fitted to the data, corresponding to a temperature of about 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. These error bars are 400 sigma error bars. So <laughs> this is an extremely well-measured black body <laughs> spectrum. So from that, we can constrain deviations from that black body spectrum at the level of about one part in 10 to the five. Um, okay, so what can we learn from this cosmic microwave background? So there are basically, so at the moment the status is, we think we understand the observed cosmic microwave background pretty well. So there are a couple of little discrepancies that we're still, cosmologists are still trying to understand, but more or less we have a good handle on how this works. If we wanna change that, so the strategy here is to say, if dark matter had interactions, how would it change the CMB? Look in the CMB, can we see signals of those interactions? If we can't, we set a limit on how strongly dark matter can interact. So what are the ways in which we can change the CMB? So there are basically two generic ways. One is we can change the plasma that the CMB is taking a picture of. If we can change how that plasma behaves, then that will modify the snapshot. The other way is sort of more, more like Photoshop. We can change the photons once they've been emitted from the plasma, once they're on their way to us. If we can scatter those photons, modify their distribution, that can also change the picture in the CMB. So we can probe either changes to the universe uh, before or after redshift 1000, but they affect things in somewhat different ways. So the sort of classic example of the first case of changing the plasma. So this plasma has oscillations in temperature and density. If I have a region of high density to begin with, then um, that will tend to attract more matter onto it through gravity. But when I try to compress together this plasma, the radiation pressure will push it back apart. That drives oscillations, but dark matter behaves differently to visible matter in those oscillations because the dark matter only feels the gravity, whereas the visible matter feels both gravity and radiation pressure. The physics of this is basically just the physics of the four stamped harmonic oscillator. So any of you have who have seen a harmonic oscillator know how to solve these evolution equations. So the presence of the dark matter changes the properties of those oscillations and in particular changes how much power there is in oscillations at different spatial scales. So this plot on the right is a sketch of how much power there would be in oscillations at different spatial scales if we had a universe with no dark matter at all. And as we change the amount of dark matter, this pattern changes. The exact details of how this pattern changes is a bit complicated and I'm not gonna go into it in, de in detail. Um, there's Wynn whose website ha here has a lot of good material on this. But this is how we measure that 84% of the matter in the universe has to be dark matter. We adjust the amount of dark matter here until we get a distribution of power in oscillations that, looks, that matches the data. So, um, that, so what this is really measuring is how much stuff is there that feels gravity but not radiation pressure. So if I turn on scattering between dark matter and ordinary matter, that makes the dark matter not quite perfectly dark it will feel a little bit of the radiation pressure along with the ordinary matter. It can get tugged along with the ordinary matter and that will modify the CMB. So scattering between dark matter and ordinary matter could modify the oscillation pattern. Um, if I heat the ordinary matter at early times, if I heat the plasma by dark matter annihilation and decay, that can also modify that plasma. It turns out the main effect of that is to change that black body spectrum of the CMB, move it slightly away from being a perfect black body as well as raising its temperature. Okay, so these are things that we can look for. What about the second kind of signature? After the CMB is released, after those photons are released, what happens to them? I said to you they fly through the universe until they scatter on our telescopes, and that's true, um, but we can say a little bit more than that. So once the CMB photons are released, the universe goes through a period called the cosmic dark ages, uh, which continues until the first stars start to form. In this period, the ionization state of the gas is expected to be very low. So the picture here is, here's the CMB, here's the dark ages, the photons just fly through the dark ages until they reach our telescopes, like the Planck telescope in Europe today. But if annihilation and decay were to inject, we said they could inject new high energy particles, those particles can heat and ionize the gas. If that produces extra free electrons, then that can scatter and deflect some of those CMB photons and change the pattern of photons that we see at Planck in the present day. So that's, uh, that's, that's the first thing that you can do. So annihilation and decay could also produce extra low energy photons and that could modify the black body spectrum again of the cosmic microwave background. This is kind of a like mini history of the universe here. The big bang occurred and the universe was a few hundred thousand years old. We had the epoch we've just been talking about with the emission of the cosmic background radiation. Then we went through this cosmic dark ages period 
And then when the universe was closer to 100 million years old, the first stars started to form, and then the first galaxies, and eventually, you know, some billions of years into the universe's formation, we got the solar system, and, and we got Earth. So let's, uh, let's move forward in time a little bit to the end of the Dark Ages, when the first stars are forming. There, we have another possible observable, although it's less mature than the CMB, and this is sort of something that we hope to see uh, observationally over the next few years. So I said that this energy flow into the universe, into the visible matter, or out from the visible matter, could change the temperature of the gas. So how do we measure the temperature of the universe? Well, then to do that, we can look at atomic transition lines. And in particular, I'm going to use an example of the 21 centimeter spin flip transition of neutral hydrogen. So this is, um, this is a hyperfine transition. Atoms, hy neutral hydrogen atoms can either be in the ground state or the excited state of this transition. And so when, so the illumination here is the cosmic microwave background radiation. Those photons are flowing through the universe. If they hit a hydrogen, a hydrogen atom that's already in the excited state, can go down to the ground state, it can emit a lion at 21 centimeters. We can look, now, the universe is expanding, that um, reduces the energy of those lions. We see that even if its initial wavelength was 21 centimeter, its wavelength will get stretched over time. So what we measure at Earth is a broad structure in frequency, which tells us about how much 21 centimeter radiation was being emitted or absorbed as a function of redshift, as a function of time. If the hy a hydrogen atom is in the ground, and there can be both emission and absorption, because if a hydrogen atom is in the ground state and it's illuminated by the CMB, it can absorb a photon from the CMB and produce absorption lines, gaps in the black body spectrum of the CMB. So how does this relate to temperature? Well, if the, if the ratio of the ground to excited states is just what you'd expect from the radiation temperature of the background, then these two effects will totally cancel each other out. You'll have as much emission and as absorption, you will see no net signal. So what we talk about is the spin temperature of the gas, which tells us how many hydrogens you have in the excited state versus the ground state. If the spin temperature is higher than the radiation temperature, there are more particles in the excited state and emission dominates over absorption. If the spin temperature is lower than the radiation temperature, then is vice versa, and absorption dominates over emission. So if we see this signal as a function of time from the early universe, what it can tell us about is what was the spin temperature of the gas compared to the radiation temperature of the cosmic microwave background as a function of redshift. Um, and this is the formal expression for how what 21 centimeter experiments actually see depends on the radiation temperature and the spin temperature. But you can see that it depends on this difference on one minus the radiation temperature over the spin temperature. Okay, so what do we expect to see for the 21 centimeter signal? So, First, the question is, well, what does the temperature of the hydrogen gas look like compared to the cosmic microwave background? If you didn't have any stars or any heating, down when the universe was at about redshift 200, the temperature of the hydrogen gas and the radiation field was the same because the radiation field was scattering off the hydrogen gas frequently enough to keep it warm, essentially. But at around redshift 150 to 200, the, that was no longer true. The universe had expanded to the point that the gas temperature and the radiation temperature decoupled, and the gas started to cool more rapidly than the radiation temperature. So this black line is the temperature of the cosmic microwave background radiation. The blue temperature is the expected temperature of the hydrogen gas. Now, this is without any heating from stars. So in reality, at some point, once the first stars start to turn on, there's going to be like a big upturn in this blue line corresponding to the gas being heated up by radiation from the stars. So what we'd expect to see is that, um, is that early on, we should see an absorption signal in 21 centimeter because the gas temperature, so there's a caveat here, how is the gas temperature related to the spin temperature? So the spin temperature can either be tightly coupled to the radiation temperature or to the gas temperature. If it's tightly coupled to the radiation temperature, then we'll see no signal. It doesn't matter what the gas temperature is doing. But once the first stars turn on, we expect them to couple the spin temperature to the gas temperature. So then what we're really measuring is the gas temperature. So at that point, we would expect there to be an absorption signal because the gas is initially colder than the radiation. And then we would expect it to turn into an emission signal as the onset of the stars, the universe lights up, the gas gets heated up, it gets ionized again. And so in this picture, this is a, this is a plot of the expected 21 centimeter signal. Uh, red and yellow colors are absorption, blue colors are emission. 
So this would be like a measurement of the universe's temperature as a function of time. And this is the redshift, and it runs from about redshift 10 to about redshift 25 on this plot. Okay, so at least in this narrow redshift window, we have a hope of measuring the temperature of the gas. If we turned on something like dark matter annihilation or decay, maybe you could heat up the gas in a place where you'd otherwise expect absorption, since you would be heating the dark matter before there are any, the visible matter before there are any stars. Um, and there are a number of both current experiments, I've listed here, and planned future experiments that are designed to search for a 21 centimeter signal from this epoch. Okay, so those are our observables. I'll say one thing, which is there's actually been a claim already by an experiment, one of those current experiments, the EDGES experiment, they made a claim in March last year that maybe they had already seen a 21 centimeter signal and measured the temperature of the gas. This is a picture of the EDGES experiment in the, from Australia, like me and David. And uh, this is a picture of the signal that they saw. So this is an absorption trough. This is redshift on the x-axis again. And this is showing how deep the absorption trough is. Now there's just one thing. So at first you say, oh, you know, this is redshift like 15 to 20. We're seeing an absorption. That means the gas temperature is lower than the radiation temperature. That's exactly what we expected. So this is good. Only problem here is if you were to compare this plot and the previous plot, you would say that this, see that this absorption trough is about five times deeper than you had expected. So that's uh, a little alarming. So that suggests actually that either the radiation temperature is higher than we thought at that time, or the gas temperature is not just lower than we thought, but lower than it could possibly have been even with no stars at all. This corresponds to a value that is lower than the blue line <laughs> that I showed you on the previous plot. So that suggests, um, well, Either this isn't really measuring the primordial temperature of the gas at redshift 15 to 20, which, I mean, this is a really hard measurement. This is the first try, you know. The odds are probably that this is not telling us something primordial. But if it is something primordial, there's something really exciting going on here, and there may be new physics, the signal. But um, I'll say a little bit more about this later, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to explain this with exotic new physics. Okay, so now before I show you the results of what we do when we use, um, when we look for signals, I want to just do some back of the envelope estimates of how would the interaction structures that I just told you about uh, result in signals in these channels. Okay, so let's do our back of Fermi estimates. Let's suppose I want to know the answer to the question of how much of the dark matter do I need to have interact through these channels in order to have a meaningful effect on the observables that I just told you about. Okay, so. Suppose I want to consider, let's consider dark matter annihilation ju just as a starting point. So um, I want to know, and I want to look at, say, the signal of ionizing the gas during the cosmic dark ages to modify the cosmic microwave background. So how much power do I need to liberate to do that? Well, suppose I asked you instead what fraction of the hydrogen gas in the universe, what fraction of the mass stored in that gas would I have to turn into energy to ionize all the hydrogen in the universe? So a single hydrogen atom has a mass of about 1 GeV and an ionization potential of 13.6 eV. So that means that if I were to convert 1 in 10 to the 8 of the hydrogen atoms in the universe into energy, that would be enough energy to ionize everything. That factor of 10 to the 8 is what makes these constraints powerful. There's five times as much mass in dark matter as there is in visible matter, five or six times as much. I told you that earlier. So that means that if I convert the mass of one in a billion dark matter particles in the universe into energy, that's enough to ionize half the hydrogen in the universe. We would know if half the hydrogen in the universe had gotten ionized at redshift 500 or 600. It would be blindingly obvious. So this is a huge signal. One in a billion particles annihilating is a colossal, enormous signal. More realistically, the measurements of the cosmic microwave background are now so good that we can tell if less than one in a thousand of the hydrogen atoms in the universe became ionized at redshift, say, 500 or 600. Um, and this was amazing to me when I first understood it, that we understand the early universe enough that we can tell if one hydrogen atom in every thousand separated into a proton and electron. So that tells you that really the kind of signals you should be thinking about are more like one in a trillion dark matter particles annihilating. That's what we're going to have sensitivity to. Let's just look at the other channels that I talked about. So, for so let's use the one in a billion number, just keeping in mind that it's an enormous signal. How much would that change the black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background? So now, okay, again, I'm liberating energy that is one in a billion, part of the total energy in the matter. How does that compare to the total energy in the CMB? 
Well, at redshift 3000, the total amount of energy in this cosmic microwave background was about the same as that stored in the dark matter. Today, it's about a factor of 3000 lower. In between, you know, it's some factor in between that. But so if I liberate a one in a billion fraction of the mass energy in the dark matter, that's at most going to be about one part in 10 to the six of the energy density in the cosmic microwave background, right? And I said before that we could measure distortions to the black body at the level of one part in 10 to the five. And remember, this is a huge signal. So looking at the CMB black body spectrum, I mean, it looks like, you know, it's an amazing measurement, but it's actually really hard for this to be competitive with looking at ionization. So I'm not going to show you any current constraints from the CMB spectral distortion, and that's why. But with future experiments, we might be able to go down to sort of 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 level of distortion, and then this would start to be a competitive probe. What about changes to the gas temperature? Well, down to redshift 200, as I told you, the CMB is keeping the ordinary matter hot. So that means if I want to change the temperature of the ordinary matter, I have to change the temperature of the CMB as well. And that's really hard because of the argument that I just did. The amount of energy that I'm putting in here is less than 10 to the minus 6 of the energy in the CMB. So that's not going to change the temperature very much. But at lower redshifts, once the CMB decouples from the ordinary matter, then I can heat the ordinary matter without worrying about the CMB. So again, there's 5 GeV of energy in dark matter per hydrogen atom, more or less. So if I liberated one in a billion of that energy, that would give me 5 EV of heating energy for every particle. 5 EV, we put in our Boltzmann constant, that's about 50,000 Kelvin. So again, this is a huge signal. If one in a billion dark matter particles annihilated, I would heat up the whole universe by 50,000 Kelvin <laughs> if it all went into heating. So um, again, big signal. Uh, to not already be ruled out by ionization, we're probably going to drop this by three orders of magnitude. But still, heating the entire universe by 50 Kelvin is, like, is not nothing. That's comparable to the expected temperature in the 21 centimeter epoch that I was telling you about. So this is going to be sort of an oral effect. So ionization is a really powerful probe of annihilation and decay. Um, spectral distortion, it's hard for it to compete at the moment. It's a good probe of physics at redshifts much higher than 1,000, so where you can't look for ionization because the universe is 100% ionized anywhere, or processes that just can't ionize stuff for whatever reason. If, you're, if your very light dark matter is bouncing off very light dark matter particle, very light standard model particles and transferring you know, 0.001 EV of energy in each scattering, that's not going to ionize anything, but you can look for it in spectral distortion. And the gas temperature, we're not going to get constraints on it from the CMB, but it's potentially a really large effect at late times. So you can ask, can we see it in 21 centimeters? Okay, so that's so okay. So that's the back of the envelope picture. If you take like one thing away from this talk, this is what I want you to remember: that you can that if you have sort of like one in a trillion dark matter particles converting its mass into energy, it has visible, observable, measurable effects on the history of our universe. You don't need much of the dark matter to interact. Okay. Now, if you want to go below, beyond the back of the envelope estimates, which we don't want to do for the purpose, well, I'll show you some constraints that go beyond it. But uh, you don't need to understand all the details of this for the purposes of this colloquium. But if you want to do a calculation and set constraints on your favorite dark matter model, um, my students and I, mostly my students, Hong Wen Liu and Greg Ridgeway, wrote this nice public package called Dark History, which computes the changes to the ionization and thermal histories when you put in any exotic source of high energy particles with an arbitrary redshift dependence and an arbitrary spectrum. So um, if you ever want to do a calculation like this, it's on GitHub. You can play with it. It, um, it fully models how those particles are injected, how they lose their energy, how they produce secondary particles as they cool down, taking into account the fact that the universe is expanding all along and you can self-consistently include astrophysical sources of heating and ionization, like starlight. So that's my advertising for the, for the colloquium. Um, and yeah, this is just another example. It's easy to run. So basically what you do is you tell it, I, this is an example where you tell it, I want to look at dark matter annihilation into B quarks with a thermorelic cross section of 2 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. Um, I, these are just parameters of the run. I press go and it gives me, this is what my, um, this is what my ionization fraction looks like, this orange line as a function of redshift. And this is what my temperature looks like as a function of redshift. And then you can test that against your favorite observational constraints. But OK, so moving away from the advertisements, let me show you some results. Um, before I do that, I guess, any, any questions before, before I go on and show you the, what happens, what the consequences are? Yes. 
Yeah, no, it's a good question. So, um, right, so often in a lot of models of dark matter, you are imagining a case where the dark, where the reason that we haven't found the dark matter yet is because it's a heavier particle than most of the ones that we know about, as well as being weakly interacting. So in that case, two dark matter particles can come together and make lighter particles, but there's just not enough energy available for two light low energy particles to collide with each other and make dark matter particles. But it would have been important in the early universe and at high energy colliders like the Large Hadron Collider, you could exactly try to run that process in reverse and make dark matter particles. However, people, so, so like for that, that's why we don't include it for this case because we're thinking about dark, the constraints I show you will be for dark matter that is heavy enough that it's hard to produce by the reverse process in a cosmological context. Um, people do also think though about very light dark matter particles and then it's not, the channel is not usually annihilation, it's, it's a different interaction structure that's um, more like just like a neutrino oscillation. But in that case, you can have the dark matter turns into visible matter and then the, and the visible matter turns back into dark matter. Like for axion dark matter, this happens. And you can use both, uh, so both channels to look for it. It's a good question. Okay, so let me show you what you, we can do with these constraints. So this is the, the one that I showed you, this is annihilation. This is the one we did the first back of the envelope estimates for. Annihilation limits from looking at changes to the ionization history, which then change the CMB. It turns out when you do this calculation carefully, uh, a la dark history, then you, um, then what you find is that this effect is essentially universal in the energy, for dark matter masses between about a keV and many TeV. So this is from lighter than the lightest particles we know about, except for the neutrino, up to heavier than the heaviest particles we know about. In the sense that every dark matter model gives you basically the same imprint in that power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background up to a normalization factor. Um, that's a non-obvious fact. I can talk more to the people who are interested in it about why it's true. But what it means is that um, CMB experimentalists can just stick that template into their analysis, ask is there evidence for that pattern, uh, determine what the answer is. It turns out the answer at the moment is no, sadly, so we set an upper limit on the annihilation rate. So this is, this is what that annihilation rate looks like. This is the cross section on the y axis. This is the mass of the dark matter on the x axis. This is the dark matter masses between about 10 GeV and 10 TeV, but this plot could actually go down many orders of magnitude on this side. These different colored lines correspond to annihilation into different particles in the standard model. The red and pink lines are annihilation straight to electrons and photons. The colored bands cover every other final state in the standard model except neutrinos. And everything above these lines is ruled out. The black dashed line is the thermal relic cross section that I mentioned to you earlier, um, which, and so these colored lines keep going down over here. The black line stays roughly flat. So what you should take away from this is that doing this one search immediately gives us constraints on a huge number of dark matter models. And in particular, if your dark matter is lighter than about 10 GeV and it has a thermal relic cross section during the cosmic dark ages, then it's dead. Unless it annihilates entirely to neutrino or largely to neutrinos or to invisible particles. Now this means you can't look for dark matter below 10 GeV. This, sorry, this doesn't mean you can't look for dark matter below 10 GeV. You can totally have dark matter below 10 GeV, but it can't have this thermal cross section. It either needs to be produced non-thermally, like through some other mechanism, or um, you need a way to suppress the cross section, the annihilation rate at light times. One of those two, okay? So like just this one study has already put like a strong set of constraints on what possible classes of dark matter models we can have. You can do the same thing for decaying dark matter. This, um, there's particularly strong limits on relatively light dark matter between sort of the MeV to GeV scale, decaying dominantly to leptons, so to electrons and positrons. Uh, this is a plot of what the constraint looks like. So now all, this is now the lifetime on the y-axis and all lifetimes below these lines are ruled out. These colored lines correspond to a host of analyses of looking for how many photons would be produced by dark matter decaying in our galactic halo and beyond from different telescopes. Just the one CMB constraint gives a limit that in this energy range is stronger than all of them. Um, we can also use this kind of strategy to look for the case of like, Someone asked earlier about multiple components of dark matter. Well, maybe there was a component that was the dark matter early in the universe, but then it decayed away um, before we got to the present day. Well, if that dark matter had a lifetime long enough that it was still around when the cosmic microwave background was formed, so when we got our 84% measurement, and then it decayed into visible stuff, uh, if it decayed with a lifetime of a few hundred thousand years, we can rule out 10 to the minus 11 of the present day dark matter density decaying 
So any other new exotic species with that property would need to be 11 orders of magnitude less abundant than the dark matter that we see today. What about, um, so what about heating? So now these are sensitivity estimates, unless, unless you believe the edges result. So we can ask, suppose you could do a 21, suppose we get a 21 centimeter measurement in a few years that tells us the 21 centimeter brightness temperature is less than minus 50 millikelvin at redshift 17. These are, you know, th th these are plausible sensitivities. Um, so that corresponds to an upper limit on the gas temperature. It says the gas temperature has to be less than about 20 Kelvin. With dark history, we can easily compute the resulting limits. What we find then is that if you could do that kind of signal, it would improve the constraints on decaying dark matter, on light decaying dark matter, by about two orders of magnitude. Or equivalently, if there was something at the current decay bounds, we should see a whopping early heating signal in these 21 centimeter observations. Now, of course, the one plane print observation we have so far is edges, which saw the very opposite of a big early heating signal. They saw that the gas wanted to be very cold, more like less than five Kelvin. Um, if, now in that case, it's a bit more complicated because you have to include some kind of new physics for what could explain the deep absorption trough in edges. But um, the various options we tested all actually lead to still pretty strong constraints on the dark matter decay, because if you're pouring in enough energy to heat up the universe by a couple of hundred Kelvin, you're pretty much always going to overproduce this bound, even if there's other stuff that is cooling the universe down. Okay, so you might pause for a little bit here and say, wait, 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 early in the talk, you said the dark matter baryon scattering could cool down the gas, and then you haven't really said much about it since then, apart from saying that the CMB spectral distortion uh, could measure it, but, it, but is not a very sensitive tool. So you could ask, well, could dark matter baryon scattering cool down the ordinary matter? leading to stronger 21 centimeter absorption. And if so, how would, how would that, you know, what would that look like? Could it explain edges? The thing is that if we had strong interactions between dark matter and baryons, well, it would modify, as we discussed earlier, the cosmic microwave background in both the anisotropies and the black body spectrum. There are also inter limits on, there are also very strong limits on dark matter baryon interactions from uh, the direct detection experiments on Earth, where we look for dark matter particles scattering off particles in our experiments directly. So the best case to get, like, uh, to get edges, to get a really strong 21 centimeter signal, would be in the case where the dark matter is pretty light, which evades a lot of the Earth-based constraints, although not all of them, as Miriam was telling me earlier. And, um, but, and, and a case where the scattering is enhanced when the dark matter is going very slowly, which is true in the early universe. So you can consider models where the cross-section scales as strongly as the velocity to the minus four. That corresponds to Rutherford scattering. So we know of processes like this. Uh, so we, so my student Chi Liang and I, who's on the job market this year and is awesome, uh, in case you're looking, uh, looked at the effects of dark matter baryon scattering in the early universe. We used an existing public code called CLASS. We modified the evolutions for how the perturbations uh, evolve and show up in the cosmic microwave background and how the temperature evolves. We calculated the upper bound on this scattering rate from this cosmic microwave background anisotropies for several different models. And then we asked, what is the maximum change to the temperature at redshift 17 that you could get that's relevant for edges. So this plot is an example for V to the minus four scaling, what's the upper bound on the cross section, and then this lower plot is showing the maximum change in temperature that you could have consistent with the CMB scattering for V to the minus four, V to the minus three, V to the minus two, V to the minus one, and V to the zero scaling of the cross section. And this red line is what you need for edges, which is to cool the gas by several degrees Kelvin. And this is really hard to do. I mean, you need the V to the minus four scaling here. You need something like Rutherford scattering. But it was pretty immediately pointed out that if you want to do Rutherford scattering, in Rutherford scattering, we have a massless mediator, like the scattering is going through the photon. Um, if you want to introduce some new exotic mediator to do this, it would have to be very light, and that's really highly constrained. So uh, several authors then went, okay, but uh, what, what if we don't introduce a new light mediator, we just use the photon? What if we posit that some fraction of the dark matter, it has to be a pretty small fraction now, actually carries electromagnetic charge? Uh, it needs to be less than, I think the limit now is less than about 0.4% of the dark matter. This allows you to get away from the constraints on the cosmic microwave background anisotropy spectrum because if only such a small fraction of the dark matter is charged, it can basically behave like baryons and you can absorb it, you can absorb it in the uncertainties on the fraction of ordinary matter. So there is a little bit of parameter space where this scenario may still be alive. But now we can go back to the photon blackbody constraints because the photon blackbody constraints just measure heat transfer. 
which is the same thing that 21 centimeter would measure, and so you can compare them to each other directly. So this is a plot of the range of millicharge of the dark matter particles versus the mass of the dark matter particles that you need to explain edges. That's the black line, and the red dotted line is the sensitivity that you would be able to get with a next generation CMB spectral distortion measurement that had a sensitivity down at the level of 10 to the minus eight distortions. Um, this may not be the easiest way to exclude edges. There may be other ways to do it. But once you really put together all these cosmological constraints, you, you can test for consistency between them. Okay, now I think, so um, I'm not sure if this is meant to be a one hour talk or a 50 minute talk, but I think in either case, I must be. 50 minute, okay. Um, then I will say, I will give you the very quick, so, so that's basically most of what I wanted to talk about. So I'll just give you the very quick summary of the last thing that I wanted to talk about, which is, so far I've talked entirely about dark matter visible interactions, but even if the dark matter only interacts with itself, those interactions can modify its distribution in this cosmic web. So the basic parametrics for interactions is self-interactions allow heat conduction within dark matter halos. And uh, if you ask what kind of interaction rate do I need to modify the distribution of dark matter halos, it's basically just requiring that the average particle scatters once in a dynamical time scale. For typical small galaxy halos, that gives you a ratio of the cross section of the dark matter mass of about one centimeter squared per gram. If you turn on interactions at this level, the standard picture for what happens for the dark matter halos is at early times, they just behave like ordinary cold dark matter, which means that there's a lot of dark matter at the center of the halo. The heat transfer first sort of equilibrates the halo, disrupts the cusp at the center, and you get like a flat density core, the density at the center of the halo drops. But then if you wait for long enough, about 100 times the time that you need for the self interactions to start showing up at all, then outward heat transfer from this core leads to what's called a gravithermal collapse. The core collapses on itself, it gets smaller and denser with time. So this is sort of the general picture of what dark matter self-interactions would do, and this is not my personal work. First, the halo sort of gets low density and fluffy, but then it collapses on itself and gets very compact. But pretty much all of that work has been done in the context of galaxies that are isolated from other galaxies. So just like floating out in the middle of nowhere, I've got a self-interacting dark matter halo, what happens to it? But the Milky Way contains many smaller satellite galaxies, which are clumps of dark matter with stars attached. And so you can ask the question about what happens in these satellite galaxies? Does this story change at all? Because in satellite galaxies, there's an interplay between the self-interactions of the dark matter particles in the satellites, the gravitational interactions between the satellites and the main halo, the tidal forces of the main halo act on the subhalo, and the self-interactions between the satellite and the main halo. So we can leave this third one out for the moment. That can be self-consistent in models where, which are natural models where the self-interaction um, is much bigger at the low velocities inside the subhalo than in the relative velocity with the main halo. So the one thing that I want you to take away about that is that in this case, something pretty cool happens. In this case, it turns out that the effect of the main halo has effectively a positive feedback mechanism on however the density of the small halo is evolving. If the small halo was in its big fluffy core phase, so it's getting you know, low density, it's developing a high core, when it falls into the main halo, um, the tidal forces of the main halo rip that halo apart. <laughs> they reduce its density further, they make it even less compact, even less dense. But if it falls into the main halo when it's already started to core collapse, the main halo leaves the central dense core pretty much untouched and strips off the outer parts, and that actually increases the rate of collapse. So the interplay between these two things gives you these divergent histories, where on one hand, you get these very low density, like very puffy halos, and on the other hand, you get these very small, compact cores. So the effect of the main halo is basically to act as an accelerant on the diversity of histories between different self-interacting dark matter halos. And this is like, so this was just a first preliminary analysis, but what that suggests is that, um, what that suggests is that self-interacting dark matter can give you a wider than otherwise expected scatter in the properties of dark matter satellite galaxies and that, that those different properties should be correlated with what kind of orbits the satellites are on and thus how much interaction they've had with the main halo over time. Okay, so, um, that's, so that, that's just sort of the, the, the like, I don't know, three minute, five minute snapshot of, uh, of that story. Okay, so I hope I've persuaded you 
that astrophysical and cosmological data sets are enormously rich. They provide powerful probes of the non-gravitational properties of dark matter, as well as the gravitational effects that we've already learned about over a really wide range of possible scenarios. The CMB gives us really stringent limits on dark matter interactions with the standard model. Scenarios that we haven't yet ruled out from the CMB could have pretty large effects on the matter temperature at the end of the cosmic dark ages, or to say it another way, 21 upcoming 21 centimeter constraints could uh, set powerful new limits or um, maybe see a signal. That, that would be very nice. More advertising. We developed a new public numerical toolbox called Dark History for the experts in the room. If you want to do studies like this, um, we would love better testers. And uh, the last thing was that if, even if dark matter doesn't interact with the standard model, dark matter self-interactions could manifest themselves in properties of the satellite galaxy through the Milky Way. And our preliminary studies suggest that the interplay between self-interactions and tidal stripping effects just notably increases the expected variability of these dwarfs. So thank you very much for listening.